Bethel. Good morning, Bethel family. How are you doing today? Wherever you are sitting, uh, you know, um, in your living room, your dining room, bedroom, we welcome you into the Bethel family this morning. So before we start everything, so I, um, I have some announcement for you. So uh, Saturday, September 12, there will be the Lutheran Hunger Network. Network. Um, they will have two neighborhood markets on Saturday. So you are all invited to take a look. Um, and if you need anything, so go and then find something there for you and your, fa um, and your family. Um, volunteers are welcome. Uh, you can contact um, uh, Minerva, and her number is uh, in, a, in the directory. Also, the flowers uh, that you will see on the altar are given also by John and Minerva for all the people who are celebrating anniversaries and also the birthday um, in September. So all of you, again, happy birthday and also happy um, anniversary to you all. Before we start, let's um, take a deep breath together to invite the Holy Spirit that connects us um, to be with one another. Wherever you are in the world, um, you are all invited. Let's invite the spirit within us that allows us to see one another as human beings, um, regardless of flaws, imperfection, and the messy people we are. The spirit that gives life. The life, when it's taken away from one, affects all of us. Please breathe with me. We are here to receive Christ. We are called to proclaim Christ. We are sent to show Christ. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captives to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to, to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hear, hears the cries of all who call out in need and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sin are forgive, forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to God's work in the world. Amen. Our opening hymn is on page six, six in your bulletin. I come with joy.
Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. We place our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with our prayer request for today. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Please pray for Renee, Bob, Neil and Linda, Al, Michaela, Sadie, Sophia, Gabe, Ken, Virginia, Don, Art, Eileen, Jackie, Cecilia, Martha, Richard and Vicky, Ethel, Leon, Doris, Megan, Myrtle, Maria, Paul, Karen, Don, Tyler, Doris, Eloise, Steve, Tom, Carol, Chris, Ellen, Jill, Dolly, Ian, Kristen, Pat, Connor and family, and finally Michael and family. We also need to pray for hope, comfort, help, and healing to all whose lives have been affected by the coronavirus. We remember especially those who are most vulnerable, the elderly, medical care providers, and our siblings from the community of color. We also need to pray for care and safety for all who are dealing with the wildfires raging through California, especially those affected by the Creek Fire that is so close to home, and for the thousands of firefighters who are working to keep us safe. We also need to pray that we may bring the light of Christ to every conflict and that God's peace be envelop us and help us to see each other through God's eyes. We also need to pray for medical personnel, first responders, and those in the military, the men, women, and families of those who serve to protect and help us. We also need to pray for our benevolence for this month, the Bulldog Pantry. We also want to pray for our, the new pastor, Sarah Gorman, as she starts her first call at St. John's Lutheran Church in Marion, Wisconsin. And finally, we want to pray for our church, in particular, Pastor Mitch, the church council, the church staff members, the nominating committee, the Sierra Pacific Synod, Bishop Mark Holmerud, and each individual here at Bethel Lutheran Church. We ask all these various requests in your son's precious name. Amen. The choir anthem is Here I Am, Lord.
The first lesson is from the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so they, that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Here ends the first lesson. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. We will actually say this responsibly. Responsively, sorry. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's? O oh Lord, you provide vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. You made known your ways to Moses and your works to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion to those 
who fear you, O Lord. The second lesson is from the book of Romans, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Welcome to those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Here ends the second lesson. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if any other member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owned him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owned him a hundred denarii and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw that what happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord sermoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have, have, should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? 
and in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Our sermon hymn is on page 10 in your bulletin, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. and peace to you from God in Jesus Christ who was, is, and will be. Today's gospel builds on last week's and gives us another strategy as to how to live in a community of faith in our family and the world. That is forgiveness. I am pretty sure for some of you it is not the first time that you've listened to a sermon about forgiveness. And I've got to warn you, it is not going to be your last as long as you remain in the church. Forgiveness is at the heart of Christian's life. The God of love who restores the image of God in human beings through Christ enables and inspires us to forgive. It's not always easy for me to preach about forgiveness. I am still working on forgiving some people in my life who have wronged me. So I'm pretty sure this is not the last time I will preach about a topic that is so central to our Christian life. So I need to get used to it. Perhaps forgiveness is easier for some of you to say than to do. But you try in a way. And for some of you, it is effortless. And you do it every day. And for some of you, it is challenging to do may be so challenging, it feels impossible. If anything, 
I want you to hear this morning that we have all been wronged, hurt, abused, dehumanized, and we have all sinned against one another. All of us. Jesus knows this. He is personally aware because he actually bore the punishment for those sins. And he calls us to extend forgiveness as we have received it from God. In Matthew 18, we read about Jesus teaching his disciples the importance of forgiveness and restored relationships. In last week's gospel, Jesus gave a simple process to walk through to make sure we do everything possible to live with healed and healthy relationship. Then Peter came up to him and asked if he should forgive up to seven times. This specific number might seem strange to the contemporary reader, but it was actually a generous offer. In Peter's day, it was rabbinic teaching that a person must forgive another three times. Rabbi Jose ben Anima said, he who begs for forgiveness from his neighbor must not do so more than three times. The biblical proof that this was correct was taken from Amos. In the opening chapters of Amos, there is a series of condemnations on the, on the various nations for three sins, even for four. From this, it was deduced that God's forgiveness extend to three offenses and that God visit the sinner, sinner with punishment at the fourth. In light of the religious norm in Peter's day, it was being generous. Peter doubled the number of times people normally forgave and then added one more for good measure. He must have expected Jesus to affirm his great offer to forgive with such reckless abandon. Up to seven times. The response Jesus gave must have been Peter back, must have, you know, um, put Peter back on his heels. Jesus, as radical as he could be, said, not seven times, Peter, but 77. Or oh, sometime in other scripture, you know, um, translation, it says seven time, 70 times seven. No matter how we translate the number, the point is the same. So my friend, Jesus was saying we ought to forgive and forgive and then forgive more. Forgiveness is unlimited. As such, it is a quality of life, a way of being, a way of living, a way of loving, a way of relating to each other, a way of thinking and being and seeing. If forgiveness is all of the above, how do we forgive someone who has done ongoing wrong to us? Will the wrongdoers interpret forgiving responses or injustice as free license to repeat the transgression? Forgiveness, by definition, involves the can cancellation of a debt. Such debt can be minor, but sometimes it's major, too in the form of abuse, bullying, dehumanizing treatment, racism, and the, la and the list goes on. And some psychologists suggest that the reason we often are reluctant to forgive is that we somehow feel that if we forgive, then we are excusing the bad behavior of all injustice. It's as if we're saying that by forgiving someone who has wronged us, it justifies what that person did. So some of you have seen on social media and the media how many times white people have called the police on black people while they were barbecuing in the park with family and friends 
jogging, nodding off in a common area, or bird watching, simply for existing. Then, when the behavior is exposed for the whole world to see, the wrongdoer cries on TV or social media and expect the victim to forgive them. My sibling in Christ, that's a case where I find forgiveness challenging. It's so easy to see myself or my children in that situation. It is scary. To use black people's capacity to forgive as a tool to victimize us again and again is a blatant form of oppression and manipulation. It feels like there is no repentance. Is that what God's want? I know you know the answer already. You know the answer is no. Because through forgiveness, God brings change. So wherever we are in our journey to forgiveness, Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter 18 that forgiveness is the only way forward. We try to see and love as God sees and loves us. You may find that you do not necessarily feel immediately better after you forgive. But as with many things in life, action often precedes motivation. When we forgive, we create space for new life. Jesus knows that as human beings, we cannot live without each other. So my friend, forgiving one another 77 times endlessly is a way of cooperative living in order to build great communities. Forgiveness is an act of hopefulness and resurrection for the one who forgives. We cannot do it on our own. It begins with God. God's forgiveness and human forgiveness are integrally related. God we revealed God's selves to us through God's Son, Jesus, through the word and sacrament. So here my challenge for you, all of you who are listening to me this morning, is finding a way to practice forgiveness every day. First, it begins with recognition and thanksgiving that we have been forgiven. God, through Christ, has forgiven you and me. We choose to forgive because that is the choice God made through Christ. It is on the cross that God shows humanity how much God's, God has forgiven us. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you love, you forgive, you feed through your living and breathing word. Grant us your love and forgiveness so we may learn to forgive one another as you forgive us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us together profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink. Now I invite you all to bring whatever you prepare, your wine or your bread for communion. So brothers and sisters, the body of Christ broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst. Guide by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Our closing hymn is on page 11 in your bulletin, sent forth by God's blessing.
in peace, my friends. Be safe. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.